Morning Tribe, we are live for our Friday live Q&A session. So today it is uh, our first week of September and we're getting right into our fall season. And so this time of year, things start to adjust. Um, our body's circadian rhythm starts to change a little bit. Um, we might find that we need more sleep. We might find that we start to crave different types of foods. Um, kids go back to school, people get sick, immunity starts to change. So there's certain things that we can just already kind of prepare for. Uh, so certain things like listening to our body, um, noticing if we want to go to bed earlier, because obviously the sun is going to be going to bed earlier as well. Um, allowing ourselves, hi Erica, allowing ourselves to get more sleep just to kind of be kind to our body in that way. Uh, going through introducing different types of fruits and vegetables into the diet. Um, I'm definitely a proponent of or a supporter of eating in season. So things like squashes, hey Layla and Lisa, things like squashes and oh, walking on the treadmill before hitting the app workout. I love it. Um, incorporating things like squashes, our potatoes, some of our more like root vegetables, some of like the darker leafy greens that come in um, are some of my favorites to start to implement during this time of year. And then adding things more like brothes, broths, more uh, cooked vegetables, things that are really warming for our body. Um, this is kind of getting into more Chinese medicine, but things that are a little bit more yin, um, are going to be those cooked vegetables, those warm uh, ingredients that will really start to soothe our bodies and also boost our immunity. So those are some things to think about. And then we come into the holidays. So the holiday season usually provides a ton of opportunities to overindulge. And I remember doing a post about um, Thanksgiving. So what's amazing about meals that will start to be incorporated in the fall season is they can be pretty darn healthy. Um, it's just the amount that we decide to consume. So alcohol probably comes in at parties, uh, different food groups. There's like pies and, you know, Halloween candy and all these things that are starting to come in. So we can already start to kind of be mindful about what's going to be coming into the picture ahead of time and choose how we want to experience those. And there's nothing right or wrong, but having that choice ahead of time can really give us uh, kind of a foresight into what we want to experience when those occasions arise because we're all going to go through it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we're now going to get into uh, going over some details of activating certain muscles when we are going through movement patterns. So I have a new carpet, which I can now use as a, a place to work out basically. So um, we're going to start with some glute activation, like really, really simple strategies. And the things that are really helpful for glute activation are the bands. So if you guys don't have these, I think everybody probably has these by now, but we have them on the Amazon list, um, which is in the unit section on the Facebook group is our Amazon list. Uh, it'll have links to all like the little pieces of equipment and supplements and like things that we love to um, recommend in terms of food items. But the bands are super great for glute activation. So you won't be able to see my whole body, but you'll be able to get a sense of what I'm trying to show you. So when we activate glutes, what's really interesting is that we have different complexes of the glutes. We have the glute medius, which lies on either side of the glute. Um, it kind of gives like that upper shelf look. Uh, we have the glute maximus that the fibers really run along the side. So they kind of go like this. And then what's really interesting is that the hamstrings like slide right underneath the glutes. And this is more of a body composition and aesthetic appeal. If you're looking to pop your glutes up, you really want to have strong hamstrings because that's actually going to lift the glutes. It's basically I'm trying to think of a good analogy. It is the thing that frames the glutes essentially. So having strong hamstrings and defining hamstrings really helps to lift the glutes up, which is pretty fascinating. And then making sure that you're activating the glute medius. When you turn on the glute medius, which is the muscle that is responsible for abduction, so bringing the legs away from the midline of the body, which would be our center, it will, as a result, activate the entire glute complex. So it's pretty cool to activate the glute medius. So things that will activate the glute medius with a band, I'll show you here to start. 
Uh, so the glute medius lies right here on the side. So anything where you are bringing the leg to the side will automatically activate the glute medius. I don't feel my entire glute complex activating there. So something that I can do as a side is I can straighten out the leg, lift it up slightly, and then bring it all the way to the side, trying to keep my hips nice and stable as far up as I can, and then bringing it all back. And in that range of motion, I definitely feel the glute medius and the entire glute complex activating. The other one to do is if you're ever doing squats, you can always use a band, like regardless of the type of squat, it can be um, regular squats, it can be sumo squats, you can do it with deadlifts. And if you focus on pressing your knees out, it will automatically activate the glute medius and then automatically start to help the whole glute complex activate as well. So if I'm going into a squat, I'm really focusing on pushing my knees out. And the pushing the knees out almost puts the weight of my body on the, on the outside of my feet. So I am really focusing on pushing out here and then I go into my squat from this bottom portion, I'm really focusing on keeping those knees pushing out and then it activates those glute medius and I feel the entire glute complex activating. So from the side, if you can see this, so if I'm standing straight and I automatically push out, my knees are gonna be slightly bent. So knees stay slightly bent to really uh, solicit the activation of the glute medius. It's kind of hard to do a squat um, and that upper range with going into full straight legs. So we never really want to do this. We never really want to go into a squat and then push our hips forward. Um, you might find that you activate the glute, but the whole thing won't be activated. So there's going to be a slight bend in your knees when you're coming out of a squat. I'm actually going to change the color of the band so you can see it a little bit more clearly. Get the red band going. So with this guy, front view. So this would be me not activating, right? My knees are still aligned with my toes, but I mean, I'm not activating that glute medius. If I wanted to activate the glute medius, I'm now pressing out and then the knees are almost going slightly towards the middle toe and I'm pressing out the whole time to come all the way back up and squeeze my glutes. From the side, pressing out, squeezing, pushing all the way up, and I would stop right here. So here I got full glute contraction. So implementing that, whether you have, whether you're doing a goblet squat, whether you're doing a squat, oh, hi, Huang, uh, whether you're doing a squat with a bar in the back, all of these, you can totally use a band and really focus on pressing out. So the weight is really gonna be on the outside your whole foot is still going to be on the floor. You're going to be like digging in with your toes. If you're someone who does handstands and you know that when you're doing handstands, you really want to kind of dig in with your fingers and also put a lot of the pressure along the knuckles. Same thing goes for your feet. When you're stabilizing with your feet, you want to feel like you're digging your toes in and placing all of your pressure, not only like in the digits, like the, the palm, um, like of your hand, but of your foot, what is that called? Um, but also that you're turning out slightly, which will really solicit that activation of the glute medius. So, hi. <laughs> so a lot of kind of glute ideas for you. Um, do you guys feel like you're able to activate your glutes effectively? Um, do you feel like you have an issue with this? Uh, do you even know what that feels like? Thoughts. Um, the other thing that you can do is any sort of leg extension or hip extension. So you can do this with a band, but it's really helpful if you are on some sort of bench and letting your legs drop and then raise back up. You can always also do this with a stability ball. So what I'm talking about here is if you're on your stomach, and your legs are separated, and then lifting your legs up from here. So if I was on a stability ball, I would get a lot more range of motion. But just from here, pushing out, and then raising those legs up, and then right back down. So, so many ways to activate the glutes. Um, those are just some ideas for you if you guys are not using bands, and you feel like this is something, Erica says, I, have to, I feel like I have to work really hard to activate glutes. <laughs> Good old autocorrect quads want to take over totally. So 
using these bands like as much as possible is super, super helpful. I even use them with um, squat jumps uh, to really just kind of force myself. So there's something that happens when we put pressure um, on a muscle um, in the sense where if I'm training someone and I actually poke where that muscle is supposed to be activating, that automatically sends a signal from the brain that it should activate that muscle that's being solicited, like poked at basically. So what you can do sometimes is actually grab your butt and think about contraction from your glutes as you're going through. And that actually helps to solicit the contraction. So a lot of times when I'm working out, I will actually like put my hands on my core. I'll put my hands on my shoulder to just kind of solicit an even better um, response from mind muscle connection to be uh, kind of moving into the muscle that I'm really trying to activate. Interesting thing. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna go over is shoulders. So Mark, whenever you watch this, this one's for you. So Mark was saying that he basically was having a little bit of pain when he was going into overhead pressing. And his explanation is that it was coming into the inside of the shoulder and he felt like maybe it was the head of the bicep, which was really astute. I think that you're right. So I've also had this issue so if you ever feel like tension that's coming in through here and kind of hitting at the shoulder um, when you're going overhead pressing and you feel like you can't necessarily extend all the way, there's a ton of muscles that are involved in that, but it's usually not just one that is having an issue. Um, so there's something called reciprocal inhibition, and this is when one muscle is really tight, so the other one that is its um, its balance partner isn't able to activate fully. So if we have a really tight bicep tendon that's connecting here at the shoulder, what's going to happen is usually the posterior chain or the rear delt isn't activating properly. So there's some things that we can do. So this one's tight, so we're going to need to stretch it, and then we're going to need to strengthen the ones on the posterior a little bit more. So one thing you can do here is take some sort of band like this, so you would take a band, and this is going to be for stretching and strengthening. So the first thing you can do is hold it between your thumb and your uh, first finger and pull nice and wide and squeeze those shoulder blades together. So this band has a pretty solid tension to it, but holding my arms out straight, pulling back, and squeezing. This is a great activation exercise just to start, and I can already see that I'm like off center. So when you pull it, you want the band to hit right kind of at your sternum level. So it's not super high, it's not super low, it's right here pulling, so you're getting the solicitation of the rear delt and squeezing in between the shoulder blades. So that would be activation for strengthening the rear delts and the, the traps that are right in between your shoulder blades that will help to retract those appropriately. The next one is arms can be overhead, so my arms are pretty much straight. I'm gonna be putting tension on here and pulling out slightly this will give me a stretch in the front of my chest, and then I'm gonna keep that tension, you can see I'm kind of shaking here, and then press out all the way and straighten my arms. So it's gonna be right here, giving a little bit of tension, and then stretching all the way out. So I'm really trying to keep my shoulder blades retracted here at the same time. So I'm just gonna turn around and show you so you guys can see. So pressing out, coming all the way back, and then straight back ahead. So that guy will actually help to stretch the front of the chest as well as, oh, hey, sorry guys, I totally forgot all these. Hey, Rachel, nice to see you. Lisa says, same, Erica, it took me almost a year to wake up my glutes. Body weight, single leg hip thrusters from our program has helped me so much. Oh yes, for sure. Um, hey, Rachel, we're going over some movement cues at the moment, but we're totally welcome to answer any sort of nutrition questions that you might want as well. So those are a couple guys to really make sure that we are not only stretching the front of the chest right to where that bicep tendon inserts at the shoulder, but also so we're strengthening um, between the shoulder blades. And then we have this little guy. So the peanut. Um, the peanut is super importante, especially for getting into some of these little tiny muscles um, that are firing. So a couple things that you can do for anything around the shoulder 
is you can lay on your side and this guy is going to go right underneath your armpit. It's like not right at my armpit. It's basically inserting right where my uh, lats are coming in towards my arm. So it feels like kind of like a meaty portion right there. And I'm going to rock back slightly and I definitely feel tension. And then I'm going to rock forward slightly so I can rock back. And that's really where the tension starts to lie. I also have this bicep tendon issue, so I know what it feels like. So that just holding it there will help to release the tension on the muscle. We have receptors that lie in the tendons. Tendons connect muscle to bone. Uh, so when we give a, a little pressure to the tendon, it will signal the release of tension on the muscle tissue. And I can actually already feel it releasing already. So this is one of them. The next one is that you wanna go towards the front of the shoulder now. So you would actually lie on your stomach. This guy will kind of be placed right about here. So it's almost um, coming in on either side of where the front of that chest muscle connects right into the shoulder. So I will be lying on it. Can you see me? <laughs> I'll be lying on it here. And I will just think about pushing my shoulder down and finding the tender spot and holding it there. You can also go through range of motion to try to straighten your arm out a little bit. I can definitely feel where my shoulder needs help <laughs> and then bringing it back down. And then the last one here, so it's going to be in the same spot there. Elbow stays in line with your shoulder. You're going to bring that hand all the way down towards the ground and then let it rotate all the way back up. So it's going to rotate all the way down and then rotate all the way back up. And strangely enough, usually my range of motion is like here and there, but just doing this exercise, just holding it there first, released it so I have more range of motion. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, let me see here. Oh, hi, Krista. <laughs> okay, so let me see. Um, yes, Lisa was saying uh, single leg glute bridges. Oh my gosh, so, so great for glute activation. Absolutely, because it's really hard for your quads to take over. A couple of tips for single leg glute um, in terms of bridging is if you're doing it on the floor, that will be like the beginner position. So if you're doing it on the floor, you want your heel to be pretty close to your butt and you actually want to drive your heel in. So thinking about consciously driving the heel in will automatically activate your hamstring. And then thinking about tucking your butt under slightly will even more so activate the hamstring. And then pushing up all the way and keeping a straight spine. So you do not want to push your chest up. You want to just push your glute up and hold that contraction. The tighter that this one is, the better your spinal alignment would be. So if you bring this guy in and actually hold it, it's going to be a little bit harder on your glute. So just kind of a tip for you there. So you're driving the heel in, bringing this knee in, and then pushing your butt up and squeezing and coming right back down. If you just do this, one, two, it's not going to get full activation. Sometimes you need to actually like hold that activation for a solid second, two seconds, three seconds, whatever it is, to really start to feel your glute firing. And especially in the beginning, doing that just all the time, just holding the contraction for three is really, really great. This takes me to another topic. So when we are going through movements, there is a speed of contraction that is really, really helpful to think about. So whenever we're going into any sort of exercises, like let's say it's a push-up. So we have two phases of muscle contraction, essentially when we're going through the majority of strength training. We have the eccentric phase, which we're basically elongating a muscle. And then we have the concentric phase where we are shortening the muscle. So here's an interesting thing. The eccentric phase is really helpful if you do it slow and controlled. The concentric phase, if you do it with a little bit more force and speed, it's gonna help to build the firing rate, like the speed at which the muscle can actually contract a lot more. So going slow and controlled on the way down is helpful for 
form for really making sure you're contracting the right muscle. And then going up with a little bit more force is gonna to help to really increase the rate of, um, of firing of that muscle tissue. So if I'm doing a push-up, and I'm gonna show you my knees just for the rate of being able to see stuff. So here, if I lower down nice and controlled for like three or four counts, and then I push up quickly, I'm gonna get a better muscle response than if I were to lower slowly and then raise slowly. So not that the first one is bad, if you're really focusing on slow and controlled movements, that can be great, but actually pushing out faster um, starts to build this muscle firing speed that we're really looking for. It'll help muscle contraction. Um, and sometimes it can also make it easier the better that you get at it. Let me see if there's any questions here. Okay. Uh, any questions about that stuff? It can be done with anything, with squats, um, push-ups, pull-ups, like all of this stuff. When you're doing the hardest part, which is essentially the concentric phase, it's good to do it with a little bit more speed. So same thing would go with um, squats for sure. Um, anytime where you're asking that muscle to fully contract, that's when you really want to um, fire a little bit faster. Any, any questions here so far? Um, let me see. The other thing we were talking about was the timing in between meals. So if there's no other questions about movements that you guys want me to show you, then I'm gonna kind of transition into touching a little bit more on balance of food and then the timing in between food. So when we are looking at our macronutrient balance, the overall goal is we're really looking at how do we stabilize blood sugar levels in a way that gives you sustained energy levels, that gives you sustained hunger throughout the day, um, that stabilizes blood sugar levels so that your body is more so in a position to use stored fat as energy between meals. However, there's something that will disrupt that um, capacity to use stored fat between meals. One of the things that will disrupt it is having a very, very big meal, a meal where we have more intake than our body can use at one time. So we will naturally take in the things that we can and then the rest will end up spiking blood sugar levels and stay in the system for a longer period. It'll take longer to digest. It'll spike blood sugar levels for a longer period. Um, also, the second thing that will disrupt the time in between meals where we can effectively use stored fat as energy is when we are consuming something that signals a sweetness. So this basically includes sweetened iced tea, um, coffee with creamer, gum, mints, um, all of these things that might signal to our brain like, hey, you're getting something sweet, your body's going to need to digest it. When our body is signaled that something sweet is coming into the picture, it's going to want to um, release insulin. It will release insulin. When it's releasing insulin, it's not releasing the other really important hormone called glucagon. So these two hormones are working hand in hand. So they're always being released. Insulin is released when we're eating and we need to digest something. Glucagon is released in the absence of insulin but they're always kind of doing this. They're always kind of like playing this little dance to balance blood sugar levels. That's what they do. So if we are having these moments in between meals where we are drinking something sweet, uh, you know, coffee creamer, mint gum, whatever that thing might be, glucagon will not be released in those moments. So the period of time in between meals, it's really ideal when your goal is fat loss and maximizing glucagon production um, to keep water or unsweetened iced tea or unsweetened hot tea or coffee without anything included to your primary source of intake during those moments. Um, yeah. Anything else here? Oh, Rachel. I have a couple questions to add on to an earlier question on the feed. Good protein snacks are hard to locate, I find. Someone had mentioned from Protein Bites or Bites from Costco, but I do not remember what those were, and of course, any other suggestions are great. Okay, awesome. So in terms of protein snacks, the first ones that are like normal snacks, um, because we sometimes think of snacks as being like some elusive meal that doesn't include like whole meals, 
<laughs> the snacks have to be like their own special thing. Um, but the snack items would be things like beef or turkey jerky. Uh, there'll be things like protein bars, low-fat Greek yogurt, low-fat cottage cheese, um, protein powder mixed with something, whether it's like peanut butter or something of that nature. There are a lot of our traditional snacks that are that people have thought in the past that are like, oh, that has protein, right? Things like hummus, things like peanut butter, things like nuts, things like trail mix. Those things, yes, they do have protein, but they are not considered a complete protein, and they're higher in fat than they are in protein. But realistically, snacks can be a mini meal. It can be half of a sandwich. It can be some sushi. <laughs> it can be just half of whatever your lunch was. Um, snacks don't have to be this like really out of the ordinary uh, intake that you're not getting at any other time of the day. Snacks can be oatmeal and egg whites. Snacks can be an egg white breakfast sandwich. Um, so there are so many different types of snacks and they can essentially just be smaller meals or they can be the exact same size as other meals. Um, one of my usual go-to snacks, so I have a few of them and these are all in the YouTube videos. Um, we have overnight oats, which is a great snack. Um, that one does require refrigerating. Uh, we have like little basically turkey sandwiches on the 100 calorie sandwich thins that you can get at Whole Foods. They're at Trader Joe's, I think now. They're also at Safeway. They're basically everywhere. They're just 100 calorie. They look like almost maybe like a quarter of what a bagel would be. Um, and those are great. I put a slice of apple on it, some Dijon mustard and spinach, and those are great. Um, I love low fat cottage cheese with apples. So, so delicious. Um, Greek yogurt, obviously, is a really great one. Um, protein bars are really great when you're on the go and you're traveling. Turkey jerky with some carrots or some uh, apples is great. I've definitely made a lot of really delicious dips with cottage cheese and Greek yogurt. Um, I've added French onion seasoning blend to cottage cheese or Greek yogurt and then dip chips in it. And that was amazing. Um, so it really depends on where you are and whether you need a refrigerator, whether you're running around. If you are running around, things like bars and beef jerky is gonna be kind of the easiest because you don't have to refrigerate it and you can just throw it in your bag and it's in a package and so there's no mess um, unless you heat the protein bars or they're sitting in your car in the sun speaking from experience. Um, does that help, Rachel? Wong says, overnight oats is my go-to right now for snacks. It's so easy and quick. Yes. I add a little bit of Greek yogurt to my overnight oats too. Awesome. And what's cool about overnight oats is you can like make new flavors. You can like make a carrot cake overnight oats. Um, that one's really good actually. Um, you do shredded carrots. You put some vanilla protein powder in with Greek yogurt and rolled oats and maybe some walnuts and it is fantastic. Um, yeah, Rachel, does that answer your question? Okay, cool. All right. Any other questions from you guys right now? Mm -hmm. It's fun to have everyone online. So generally speaking, what we do is Wednesdays, we'll do more of the nutrition feedback. And then on Fridays, we'll start to get into some more of the form cues for those of everyone that's doing training on their own or is using the app. We just want to be able to get here live because it's so much easier to do this live and it, I can show you like different tools and different food items and movements. And so that's why we do these live sessions. So it's really just to support the process and answer any questions that you guys have. Um, Rachel says, I try not to have so much animal protein. My other question is about granola. Okay. So some animal, some vegetarian options, are there's a uh, seitan which i freaking love seitan is a vital wheat gluten um it's actually not the same gluten that's uh, usually causes like gluten intolerance it's actually the natural form of gluten that we remove from items um so seitan is a really great lean protein it's probably the leanest vegetarian protein and you can find that in the amazon list uh, also, an item called Celebration Roast, um, which is from a brand called Field Roast. It's a really, really delicious uh, 
vegetarian based protein, um, pretty low in fat and carbohydrates. It does have some fat and carbs, so just something to be considerate of. Um, in terms of granola, what's your question about granola? I have a little bit of a delay here. Okay, I'm looking for a low carb granola, which is not too high in fat. Do you have any recommendations? So the nature of granola is it's a complex carbohydrate. So finding a low carb granola would be pretty hard, like impossible. Um, I'm adding yogurt with it for a good breakfast, but I end up with a very high amount of carbs. So uh, if you're using low fat Greek yogurt, it's gonna be about 20 to 30 grams of granola for what you would essentially be adding. Um, and if you want to have granola with it, I mean, granola is a carb, so it's really kind of hard to make that a low carb addition. Um, but what is the type of yogurt that you're using? Because that could be more of the factor than anything else. Because you can't really take the carb out of a carb. <laughs> Sorry, I have a little delay, so I'm just waiting. I would say the more the thing that you can toggle with more in terms of granola is whether how much fat it has in it usually, because there's some really high fat granolas that have like nuts and coconut in it and like chocolate chip pieces and all these things. And then the one that I'm using right now is from Udi's. So the brand is Udi's, it's a granola, it's pretty darn clean, it doesn't have a lot of sugar added to it. So that's another option is that some of them will have a lot of um, like honey added to it. Siggy's non-fat, okay, the normal low fat still has the same amount of carbs. Interesting, so usually uh, low fat for most brands will have less carbohydrate than the non-fat. They'll have less sugar overall. Um, but in terms of the carbs for granola, you might try the Udi's brand. Um, that one definitely is pretty low in added sugar, but from the rolled oats, those are gonna be complex carbohydrates, so it'll be hard to keep those lower in carb. Um, but different, uh, let me see. I can't toggle to the MyFitnessPal just at this moment because I'm actually using the phone, but I believe that the, the items like Fage and there's another brand, Mountain Creamery, those guys especially, there is definitely a difference between low fat and non-fat Greek yogurt. The low fat will have less sugar um, than the non-fat and less fat than the full fat. So it's kind of the best of the happy medium. So realistically, it's just trying to see, uh, yeah, I would try looking for low fat and seeing what the difference is there. Um, Lisa says, Siggy's has a solid amount of carbs. Fage 2% Greek yogurt is very low carb. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, so check it out because all brands are not created equal. And some of them, like when I'm going through the grocery store, I'll literally look at all the options and I will pick it up and I'll look at the nutrition facts and I'll be like, okay, which one has like the, the best ranges for me um, and what I'm looking for. And then even more so deeper inside that, I'll start to look at the ingredients that they use. So I'm really looking for the cleanest ingredients possible um, so when I start to see that after like, you know, the most easily identifiable first three ingredients, after that, when it starts to go into all of these crazy ingredients that I can't really pronounce, I'm like, okay, maybe this isn't what I want to put in my body. Kind of a rule of thumb is like, if I can't pronounce it and I don't know where it comes from, my body probably won't do a very good job digesting it either. Um, Rachel says, right, the fage I usually use in a place of sour cream, just trying something with a little sweetness with the granola. So that sweetness, <laughs> um, Rachel, is where the additional carb is coming from. So if anything, what I do instead is I'll actually add either some liquid stevia uh, to it, which will sweeten up that Greek yogurt the, from the fage, um, and or I'll add a little bit of protein powder to the Greek yogurt and that will sweeten it up naturally and add additional protein as well. So it sounds like it's not really the granola. I often get a fruit flavored yogurt. Oh, well that's why the carbs are so high. Yes, so the fruit flavored yogurts are no bueno. Um, they are refined processed sugar. I would highly recommend staying away from those. Uh, there's been a lot of research about how 
fruit flavored yogurts really cause a, um, a negative impact, especially on our body's ability to metabolize that kind of sugar. Yeah, if I can find the um, article about that, it was very specific about fruit flavored yogurt and how the industries are proponing this or um, you know marketing it for being healthy and it's anything but healthy. So that is something that I would recommend that you just take out. I would add your own fruit, add your own fresh fruit and don't get the um, processed you know fruit items that are being mixed in with yogurt. Yeah, okay, we, we discovered the issue. <laughs> Yeah, if you remove that and you go for the plain Greek yogurt and then you can add some stevia or protein powder and then add granola to that, you should easily be able to find um, the, the lower carbohydrate range. Yes. Okay. Let me see. Rachel, thanks. I had that today just trying to mix it up with variety and some good flavor. Maybe I will add honey. Honey will add a lot of carb as well. So honey is a straight sugar. So what I would really recommend is like actually as you're entering in these food items, check, like click on the food item and look at where the impact is coming from. Um, because that's why the app is so incredible. We can actually sit here for like the first time in our history really and be able just to look at the details of the impact and balance that that each individual item is adding. So if you're looking at honey, actually try entering that in and seeing the impact that it makes in terms of sugar. <laughs> but it's going to be a good amount. Um, and it's not that, to say that you can't use honey. Um, sometimes I use honey in my oatmeal, um, especially if it's local, because uh, that can be incredibly good for the immune system. Local honey is very, very good for things like allergies and just overall immunity. But this is why the app is so helpful, because we can basically sit there with different things that we feel like we want, and then we can adjust the amounts that we're using to kind of toggle. It's like a game, it's like a puzzle, um, to toggle and see what would be the best balance that we're looking for with the ingredients that we have to use. And sometimes I've found like freaking phenomenal um, new recipes by just like kind of playing around with numbers and ingredients that I have in the house and seeing what I find would be the best balance. Okay, you guys, I'm going to sign off for now and get back to coaching for the morning. Uh, thank you all for joining. This is always a super fun time for me, and I hope you guys get a lot out of it. And I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend, and I will talk to you all very soon. Mwah. <laughs>